ready to go? And we're recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the um, Tech London Advocates Forum. My name is Ross Shaw, founder of Tech London Advocates and Global Tech Advocates. Now, just to start um, some housekeeping, uh, we're screen recording this forum as we usually do. So if you would not like to be included, please turn off your camera. And then obviously, just to double check, please may I ask all of you to go on mute so we don't get any any background noises. Uh, just a bit of background. Um, as soon as we went into lockdown back in March, uh, I wanted to make sure that advocates still had access to the support network that TLA offers. Um, we needed to start sharing advice, guidance, and expertise, frankly, now more than ever. So we introduced the TLA COVID-19 Resource Hub. And on the website, you'll find a, a directory of advocates who are offering to give free help and advice to anybody who needs it. We have over 60 advocates who are listed on the website. There's a whole section with online resources, information, and blogs that you can access. Um, we have done a number of what we call TLA surgery podcasts, which feature Ali Barrett, who is our normal event comp here. He and I have uh, done seven of these podcasts now, and I would encourage you to listen to them. And this is the latest TLA forum Zoom call, which is a fortnightly check-in um, for advocates who can speak to me and the guests from our network with anything that's on their mind, and for our guests to share what they are working on and what they're thinking about. So I'm particularly excited about this forum because it features some wonderful leaders from the Global Tech Advocates Network across Europe, both from groups that have already launched and have been up and running, and also with uh, uh, two groups that are getting ready to launch in the coming months. So we have invited this week the following groups, Tech Nordic Advocates, Tech Spain Advocates, Tech Emerging Europe Advocates, uh, Tech Netherlands Advocates, and Tech Italy Advocates to share their insights, to share their observations and perspectives on their tech hubs in their respective markets. And obviously, we're going to focus this conversation a bit more specifically on the impact of COVID-19, what these leaders are seeing in their respective hubs. So with that, I'm going to ask, I'm going to call out the group and I'm going to ask the individual to introduce herself or himself to you. So let's start with Tech Nordic Advocates. Over to you, Jeanette. <laughs> and Jeanette's frozen. So I will come back to Jeanette on that. Hopefully she can come back in. Uh, Teresa, Tech Spain Advocates. And I, I was muted. I'm, I'm, I'm here now. I was You're muted, here. All right. Back to you, Jeanette. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes, I, I was muted centrally, I think. Uh, Jeanette Kausen, I'm the founder and CEO of Tech Nordic Advocates. Uh, so uh, headquartered, as it were, in Copenhagen, cover the five Nordic countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland, and the three Baltics, um, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Uh, and we launched our own COVID-19 resource hub on the 1st of May, um, focusing on the Danish market. I can talk a little bit more about that. We have a lot of experience. We have 17 partners now. Uh, on the hub that are, are contributing funding and, and other resources led by the Danish uh, investment, it's called the Growth Fund, it was Danish State Investment Agency. And, uh, and last week we had uh, the Greater Copenhagen City Council come on board as well, so the, uh, the equivalent to GLA. And, and all together um, we have 17 partners, many of whom are, are contributing uh, money uh, not all of them, but but they're all contributing in one way or another. Um, and uh, you can find the hub on technordicadvocates.org. But a um, lot of experience in running the hub. I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, from, from anyone. Super. Thank you. Teresa, over to you, Tech Spain Advocates. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Teresa Martin. Um, I'm speaking from Madrid. Uh, and I am very happy to be talking from my office and not from home any longer. In, in Spain, we finalized our state of alarm after the, uh, 97 very long days of, uh, of various stages of um, COVID confinement and uh, social distancing. And we, we, we only finalized uh, that uh, time um, on Sunday. Uh, so I, I'll let you know later how we are going back to the new normal. Um, our group launched in uh, September 2017, a lot has happened ever since. We've made events uh, throughout Spain and, and also in China. 
with uh, some of you uh, guys, which is, and it is always a pleasure to say hello once again. Um, I am a member of uh, the COVID task force uh, of volunteers. Um, and uh, um, as I said, I am a lawyer and these, are, these have been really, really very busy times for lawyers. We have worked uh, nonstop. Uh, so we deserve a, a holiday, but uh, the industry of tourism, which is something we can discuss later, uh, is struggling to get out of the uh, old situation and come into the new one. Uh, so anything you need from Spain, just say hello. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. And let's go on to Italy, to Enrico and Anders. Welcome. Hey guys, uh, thank you, Russ. This is Enrico Noseda. I founded uh, Tech IT Advocates together with Anders, who is also on the call. A couple of years ago, we operate out of Milan. Um, Tech IT Advocates is actually run in partnership with uh, Cari Plow Factory, which is the largest innovation hub in Italy. Um, basically, uh, the hub supports uh, corporates in their innovation journey and startups in their growth uh, journey. We organize events uh, for Tech IT Advocates and uh, host uh, the events uh, within, uh, within our space in Milan. Um, like Teresa said, if you ever uh, can visit Milan, you are more than welcome to knock on our doors. Thank you, Enrico, that's great. Now I want to move on. We've got two new groups in formation stage uh, launching, uh, we hope, later this year. So um, Esther, let me turn over to you for Tech Netherlands Advocates. Nice to see you. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, so I was due, we were due, we were due to launch, uh, us um, Tech Netherlands Advocates, um, <laughs> oh, this week. I know, I know. <laughs> Um, but uh, but we've decided it would be pragmatic to defer um, and actually helpfully, um, I have to apologise, there's a light that goes on and off in this office, um, helpfully uh, Rotterdam um, have their Upstream Festival, which is the 21st to 27th of September. Um, and we're very happy to um, to have us uh, do our actual launch um, at that point. Um, unfortunately, Russ, is, well not unfortunately for Russ, because he's on holiday for his wedding anniversary, but it means he won't be with us. Um, in spirit though uh, but yeah we're gonna go um gonna go live in september in terms of the landscape here it's interesting it's you know it's the netherlands isn't it so it's quite chilled i think compared to um some of the other places uh, with things like covid it's certainly been a huge amount of um support uh, from government and things are obviously starting to open up again i'm sat in the co-working space um here um, so so yeah i think there's been there's been a huge amount of social impact and um, tech and people kind of getting involved on the ground um, as a direct response to covid so so there is a kind of much more positive um approach here i think um, for you know from from, what, from where i'm sitting um, big network that already exists in the country um, for tech um, but i think um, the purpose of, of wanting to set up an advocate group here um, was to kind of uh, have more of a sort of a global um, connection um, with the other um, advocate groups uh, worldwide so that was the that was the driver behind it there's not a huge amount that the netherlands needs you know it's very very well you know supported uh, funded um, but certainly um, attracting uh, foreign investment and startups uh, scale-ups who want to either relocate to the netherlands or um, collaborate you know between uh, between countries that's kind of going to be our focus uh, going forwards and hopefully a bit of fun as well once all these restrictions are lifted <laughs> And you're already actually you're kind of up and running. You've got your Twitter account up and running. You're sending out great newsletters at the moment. So I know you're starting to build your advocates community there. So yeah. well done, Esther. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Now let's move on to Tech Emerging Europe Advocates. We have three of the leaders from there on the call. We have Emiliano, we have Miriam, and we have Andrew. So maybe Emiliano, if I can start with you, if you can introduce yourself, tell us a bit about your plans for Tech Emerging Europe Advocates and uh, the many markets you're planning to cover. So actually you mentioned to uh, Caroline that since the three of us are here, that one of us will speak to, let's say, spare some time. So Andrew will give you a kind of an overview of where we stand. Okay, great, super. Andrew. Yes, so uh, my name is Andrew Robel and I'm uh, the founding partner of Emerging Europe, which is the uh, organization that is sort of running Tech Emerging Europe 
advocates. Um, Emerging Europe is a uh, networking platform. It's a media platform. It's and it's a, a an, an intelligence uh, platform as well that covers, like you said, Raz, uh, quite a few countries. So uh, normally it's about twenty. It's over twenty countries. In this case, in the case of um, tech emerging. Uh, Europe advocates. It's 25 countries stretching all the way from Slovenia to, uh, you know, the Central Asia actually. Uh, so, so that's quite a uh, quite a market. Uh, we are planning to officially launch Tech Emerging Europe advocates later this year in November. Uh, we're now getting ready with uh, with everything, uh, and of course, if you are interested in. Um, uh, anything related to Central and Eastern Europe, we're always ready to help. Uh, like Russ said, we have I have two more colleagues here, Mariam and Emiliano, and we're always, like I said, ready to help. That's great. Thank you. And I have the 24th of November in my diary for the launch event in Prague. So I'm hoping we'll be relatively back to normal by then. So I look forward to uh, getting you guys up and running and launching at that point in time. Yes, it's the 24th of, of November that we're planning to launch the, yes. um, the initiative. Super, thank you. Right, let me start uh, with some questions on my side, and then I know we've probably got a, a few questions from people who are, are on the Zoom call. Um, first off, uh, I wanted to just get a sense of what the lockdown experience has been like, and, and where are you now? And actually, Enrico and Anders, I'm going to start with you because, you know, my sense is that Italy was the very first to go into lockdown. Um, the Lombardia region was hit very, very hard. Um, what happened? Where are you now? Are you optimistic about things improving going forward? Thank you, Russ. Um, you, you are right. We were pr probably one of the first regions after China to be affected by the virus. We responded quite rapidly. Um, as you know, we've been uh, probably the first country outside of China to uh, move into an extreme uh, lockdown, um, which basically meant uh, we uh, couldn't leave our homes, uh, except for very specific reasons. And with a written self-certification that states where you are going, from where, and what was the reason of your, of your travel. Uh, and in any case, um, the list of reasons uh, uh, for which you were allowed to travel were very, very few, like um, um, for health uh, emergencies and a few others. Moreover, the checks were really tough. Like, literally, if you left your home after 300 meters of walking, you would have been stopped by the police who asked you for the reason why you were out of your home. So in fact, as this is certified by, you know, uh, if you look into the, all the uh, maps uh, uh, app applications uh, like uh, CityMapper or, or Google, can state that the movement in, uh, in, in Italy went down to about two to 3% of what was uh, normally happening. Um, and this lasted quite a few weeks. So we have also been among the latest to free uh, the lockdown because in particular Lombardy, the region where we are based, has been severely affected with a few villages and cities in full lockdown, uh, completely surrounded by police and military that didn't allow anybody to get in or out, like in Wuhan. Um, that situation, fortunately, did, uh, did move the needle. So uh, the numbers uh, in, started going down and then they released the, the situation back in June, at the beginning of June. And uh, as of now, we are in phase three, which means pretty much starting to go back to normal, which it means you can go uh, back to work um, following uh, uh, quite a few rules. But I have to say most companies are still working from home, most of them. Restaurants or bar are open with a few restrictions, like they don't allow over a certain number of uh, people in their premises. But I have to say 
uh, while bars are almost back to normal, that restaurants are not really uh, filled up with people. Uh, people tend to be quite concerned. They avoid locking them up in uh, enclosed spaces. They, they rather meet outside. If a restaurant has tables outside, that will be filled up with people. Otherwise, it's, it's probably more likely it's going to be empty. On, um, on business, I have to say, most companies who can afford to do so are still in smart working. Most companies have postponed the uh, smart working measures at least until September, some of them until December. And um, overall, I have to say this has been, uh, like for everybody else, a very negative experience, of course, on the, under the health perspective and, you know, we have... Uh, many deaths and, and it's been a, a terrible period. On the other side, in terms of digital transformation, I think it's been, uh, it's been very positive. Uh, very clearly, there's lots of businesses who are heavily struggling, no doubts about that. But on the other side, if you want to look at the, at the glass half full, uh, the situation has taught us that it can be done. You can actually do uh, efficient, smart working you can actually trust your employees you don't need to check and control every single step they make you can have people working from home maybe at their at a very junior level and they will not spend most of their time on facebook like you feared before you understand that people work on a you know focus on projects and delivering on on the time that you're giving to people that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective. Teresa, I know Spain, I guess, on the 1st of July is opening up to outside travelers, which we're excited about. But I know it's also been a pretty, pretty tough go in, in, in Spain. What's your perspective and where are things now? And, you know, are you optimistic about things moving forward? You're on mute. Yeah, thank you, Russ. Uh, first of all, I, I must say I, I uh, subscribe to most of what Enrico just said about Italy. Uh, we, we, we were kind of the second or third in Europe to go in full lockdown, and we spent there uh, uh, 20 days. Uh, the rest of the time we've uh, undergone phases one, two, and three, and we are uh, mostly back to normal, uh, except for social distancing and uh, face masks, um, we are generally back to normal. Um, um, Spain has taken a very, a very serious toll uh, by this, through this pandemic. We have uh, lost lives and we have lost uh, work. Um, the total cases in Spain of uh, people who have caught the disease are around 245,000 people. 245,000 and uh, 28,000 have died, uh, half of uh, whom between uh, Catalonia and uh, the region of Madrid, because that's, that's where the, most of the population is concentrated, apart from the coasts. Um, the impact of the pandemic has been different uh, throughout the regions, with Madrid and Catalonia as being the most affected. Um, but one of the things that we, we, we could highlight about the reaction in Spain, uh, Spanish society is the discipline in taking um, on all the measures imposed by the government, including a confinement at home. And it was really, really impressive to see empty avenues and empty uh, streets and nobody there except for a few um, dog uh, workers who were allowed to go out. Um, and after some weeks, um, people with men mental illnesses. We did. Uh, we did. Uh, we were allowed to go to work uh, as a different, uh, and, and that made a difference. Uh, not not everybody could um, go to work, but most of the people, if, if they uh, could prove they were going to actually work, uh, they could do it. However, working from home is here to stay. We have also uh, realized that it can be done that it saves a lot of time, although it also uh, generates some conflicts uh, with productivity, which uh, we, we feel is, is lower uh, in a situation of a uh, lockdown and, and staying at home. And therefore, people are now uh, going uh, back to the offices with lots of uh, safety measures all around. 
uh, mm, the, the majority of the companies are uh, having employees take tests, blood tests, uh, or uh, speedy tests, depending on the case. And we have our temperature taken every day in lots of uh, places and shops, shopping malls and at work. So that's uh, an overview of, of how we think safe and safe. Thank you. Jeanette, I'm going to come to you. Um, obviously, you, you're representing a number of different uh, Nordic countries. Um, the lead article in today's New York Times focuses on the borders now with Sweden, between Sweden and Norway, Sweden and Finland, and issues between Sweden and Denmark, because Sweden has taken a very different path. What are you hearing? What can you share with this group about lockdown and where things are going at the moment? You're on mute. Uh, you're on mute. Jeanette, Jeanette, you're on mute. But um, it's, I think there's a central uh, on mute. Anyway, yes, uh, as you just said, so uh, I represent eight countries, and uh, and as you have just said, that there's quite a difference between some of the countries, although most of the countries have adopted a similar strategy. So Denmark, Norway, Finland, Baltic countries have, have locked down really early on. Sweden has followed quite a different strategy um, and hardly um, locking down at all. Um, and as you can see in the media, uh, the outcomes in, uh, in the, the first group has been quite different to to the outcome in Sweden. And, and as you know, my board member in, in Sweden, Barry, is talking to me daily about how you know the massive differences and about how Sweden is completely open and uh, and there is a, a degree of I guess surprise um, about how how that situation has been handled so um, so the other countries have uh, have locked down early and have contained uh, the the virus quite well been very very stringent from the beginning uh, and so uh, in Denmark where I'm right now we are also pretty much returning to normal there's still social distancing with one meter uh, just but people are going uh, back to offices uh, restaurants and bars are open um, there's hand sanitizers available and, and, and so on and that's largely the situation in uh, in Finland so I spoke to the other countries yesterday so same in Finland same in Norway and, and so on uh, and so starting to get back to normal um, the, 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 the key issue is around is around borders opening so Denmark's been quite strict about um, closing borders so borders are opening to um, to most countries now the end of June but still Sweden is kept out um, of, of Denmark and some of the other Nordic countries so you can imagine some of the problems that's causing um, but but um, you know so from a death toll perspective the impact has been um, a lot less in in this region um, than in in other regions proportion to size uh, just because it's it's been the measures have, have been quite quite straight and people have adhered to him quite well I, I would have I would thought I guess it's part of the culture that we kind of do what we're told in the Nordics it's sort of fairly controlled regulated society so so people tend to do what, what they're told um, so so now it's all about rebuilding isn't it and, and in same as the other countries from a business perspective startups have been particularly badly affected we persuaded the Danish government early on that that you know creating this one-stop shop hub with support just like the TLA one was the right thing to do and we have certainly got a huge amount of credit for that right. uh, Danish growth fund came to us and said it's just so well spotted that you guys saw that we need this um, a platform that can bring all the resources under, under one hat sadly we couldn't get Nordic funding to do it in the other countries we're still working with some of the other countries to see if we can finance something locally but certainly we have another funding application out that we hope to hear from tomorrow where the question is now being asked as to what's now going to happen to the hub that we've been running um, for, for these last few months and, and will it live on within TNA and so I think um, you know from a, from a bad situation and a very serious situation we are now in a position to really kind of bring the hub into what will become the future TNA uh, not only in Denmark but probably build on the whole principle around the help and the mentoring and link to investors and free resources and so on for, for our wider network not just just in Denmark, but as a whole. I think with the exception of Sweden, which is, you know, quite a different situation, we are we're definitely on track um, here to 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 recover to what it looks like. Great, thank you. Esther, give us a picture of the Netherlands in terms of lockdown, where you are. Are you optimistic about things improving in the near term? 
Yes, I apologise because I kind of said it all at the start, didn't I? Um, <laughs> I thought, oh. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, so it's quite strange for me because I, um, I was actually um, in Venice when lockdown happened, when it got cancelled, but I'd already moved on. Um, I was then in Mallorca when it all started getting locked down. And then I ended up having to go back to the UK. So for the first uh, 12 weeks of lockdown in the Netherlands, I was stuck in the UK, actually. So I feel that I've come back to the Netherlands at a time where um, it was completely, you know, it was it was shut down. And now it's it's very much um, going back to, um, it's, a, look, it's, a, it's a different kind of normal. Um, I think the, the way that we've sort of communicated with um, our advocate group is making them aware of the resources um, that are out there. We didn't um, set up a hub, obviously, because we're, um, we're, we're just, you know, kind of brand new, but I wanted to at least make sure that we were keeping people informed about the support that was available. Um, I, I think it's... Um, I think it's relatively, when I listen to obviously to Italy and Spain, I'm kind of reminded that, you know, some people are really, really suffering because of this. Um, there isn't that, there isn't that sense of that here. It's much more about um, uh, a lot of startups um, have managed to still close their rounds. You know, the, there's kind of um, quite a positive, um, I think, approach about the future um, for the tech community here. Certainly when I talk to the guys and this it's a, it's a tech co-working space, you know, everybody is, everyone's pleased to be back. Um, you know, everyone's kind of happy, even though we're having to keep a, you know, a bit of a distance uh, yeah. compared, to, compared to normal. So, so I think generally, um, generally a positive vibe, um, a few amusing things, um, if we're allowed to, is um, obviously coffee shops got closed and were re immediately reopened two days later. <laughs> <laughs> um, due to a, a significant uh, public uh, upheaval and, uh, and then at the moment the biggest challenge at the moment is um, gyms and personal trainers uh, that, that there's due to be an announcement today about whether they're reopening I don't know if it's happened and also sex workers are lobbying quite hard uh, to get back to work so those are the two industries that are still still not functioning as uh, as normal but yeah <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> And, and to the folks at Emerging Europe, um, I'm not sure, Andrew, if you're going to pick up or if somebody else is, but obviously you're covering different markets. Maybe give us the spectrum of, you know, who's really locked down, who's adopted the Sweden model, um, are countries kind of emerging from this? What, what's the take across? So I, I, can, I can say that uh, our region um, looked at uh, the virus, uh, you know, quite seriously from the very beginning. And... Uh, most of the countries went into lockdown right away uh, and are now reopening. And some, some of the countries are already opened. Uh, you know, the number of cases is, is going significantly down. There are a number of countries where uh, that hasn't, you know, happened yet. Like Poland, for example, uh, the number of cases in Poland, even though the country went into lockdown quite early on, is still quite high. Uh, around three, four hundred cases, new cases a day. Uh, Belarus, which uh, was sort of trying to say that you know there is no coronavirus there, is going through a serious situation as well. Um, also, in countries further east, like uh, you know Central Asia, uh, that some of the countries are still uh, suffering. Other than that, uh, you know airlines start operate, have started operating already. Sometimes within countries like in Poland, at the beginning from the 1st of July, it's actually gonna happen, uh, you know, pretty much across the, the, the region. Uh, so I think the situation is, uh, you know, shopping malls, uh, barbers, restaurants, these are mainly open already uh, across the region. Uh, I think we're, we're going back to normal, actually. Uh, we're operating out of London, of course, as Emerging Europe, uh, but we have people across the, the ground and, uh, I mean, across the region. So we hear from them that it's, it's actually getting better and better. Uh, but Andrew, if I may add here, it's also good that uh, our region had kind of a window to adapt and see what's happening elsewhere. Yeah. We were able to go into lockdown earlier and control things from the beginning, which Italy and Spain didn't have. Uh, yeah, the, 
in, in the end, we had countries like Slovenia and Montenegro basically being COVID-free now. They were one of the first countries in Europe to be rid of it. So that was a combination of going to strict lockdown and having this time to learn from others. Yes. Yeah, because the first cases were actually reg uh, uh, registered way later than they were, for example, in Italy or Spain or, or in other places. Okay, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you all of you for painting that picture. Now, I, I wanted to just move on and, and talk more specifically about tech, the tech sector, kind of the state of startups, scale-ups, the level of investment. What are you seeing? Esther, you touched on this a little bit um, in terms of, you know, money is still flowing in. Is it, is it an optimistic picture? Um, are, you, are, are a lot of startups running out of cash? Actually, Jeanette, I'm going to go to you um, first, um, just with respect to building on the, the COVID-19 resource hub. You've probably had a lot of visibility. W what's it like there? How are startups uh, doing? What's the investment level like in, in, in some of the Nordics? Yeah, I mean, I think by far the, the biggest problem we've, we've come across is, uh, is access to investment. Okay. So um, a lot of investors have pulled out. A lot of investors have delayed their investments and so on. So it's all about having run rate, right? Um, and so a lot of startups were, you know, you know, put in a very, very difficult situation in terms of actual survival just because they, they lost cash. Yeah. So that's really important. The other thing that has actually really surprised us in some ways is actually the extent to which... Um, startups have suffered badly from uh, lack of access to international markets. And, um, and, and that has actually really surprised us. And, and once again, has really brought home the differentiation and in technology actually. The way we really Jeanette, we're struggling with your connection a little bit. Really, so hey, we launched in Germany. We were about to launch in Holland, North America, and okay, yes, uh, I am actually outside. So, can you hear me a bit better now? A little bit better, yeah. Um, uh, all right, she's dropped. All right, Esther, can I come over to you? I know you started to talk about the scene there. Sounds like you're optimistic that money is flowing into the startup ecosystem, etc. What do you see? Yeah, so there's um, there's obviously the, the government support, including the, the bridge fund, um, and also spoke speaking to uh, investors. And directly about kind of the you know how they're how they're viewing it. Um, <clears throat> some of the uh, there's like Apple, there's venture capitalists who are kind of angel investors who are all together, and they're basically going 50% are holding back and 50% are investing as normal or actually increasing their investment. They see it as a good time to buy because they can buy cheap. Um, so 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 it's a, it's a it's a mixed um, a mixed picture. One of the other um, the other things that there's a lot of um, like next week on the 30th and um, there's a uh, investors you know can meet startups you know the, there's there is quite a lot of uh, bringing uh, startups and investors together even you know despite the the kind of lockdown and everything doing a lot of stuff online um, and one of the things that we're saying actually is the number of startups who are applying um, for funding has actually reduced a bit and that's causing a problem because there is money um, that needs to be spent it's time limited um, and actually there's so there is a there's a bit of mismatch going on on both sides and um, is the kind of the general um, the general feel of it at the moment are there any tech verticals that are doing particularly well whether it's health tech or fintech or cyber or ed tech are you picking up on any of that yeah, I mean the Holland fintech is um, is the is the kind of the main, and they're, they're kind of like a six hundred strong network, you know. Here, so so fintech certainly, I think some of the valuations on some of the businesses are being, um, you know, they're going into the kind of you know the kind of the big rounds that they're, they're sort of being reduced. Um, but I think that's really taking the heat out of slightly overheated market, probably. Um, yeah, health tech um, certainly, and a lot of the social and um, 
uh, clean tech, green tech, um, that, that kind of stuff is, which is obviously an area of interest um, for, for me. Um, and that that's kind of seems to be where uh, there is still, you know, there's still um, good traction. Okay, sounds good. So Desa, from your side, uh, are you seeing startups secure funding rounds? And has mm -hmm. the government also stepped in with any type of loans or funds for startups and scale-ups? What, what, what are you seeing there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me start with the last bit of your question about the government. Uh, indeed, the government has um, allowed um, 100,000 million euros, 100,000 million euros, which is uh, in, in uh, British pounds, 90,500 million. Uh, in loans, which are guaranteed 80% by the government. So, um, and these, these funds are distributed by the banks, not by the state. They are backed by the state, but it is the banks who actually provide the loan, select the, the, the borrowers. Um, the borrowers that have been more benefited by these um, state-backed loans um, are those who already were in debt. So uh, startups who had already had access to uh, loans from the banks will more, most surely benefit from these loans, which are very cheap. They have one year, um, uh, the first year they don't have to pay anything back, either in cash, or, or sorry, uh, either interest or principal, and they, and they last for five years with an interest rate. Uh, between 1.75 and 3. So this is really a very good opportunity to be uh, asking for uh, financing uh, from Spanish banks. Also the state, um, the usual state um, uh, backed uh, normal loans which are given by the authorities directly such as the Central Center for Development of Technology and other uh, institutions have been working normally. So in that respect, COVID hasn't affected much. Uh, although it is true that civil servants have been working from home and they are now back to, off to the office only one day a week, and that slows processes down as well. Um, there are other um, measures approved by the government that the startups can take advantage of, such as the relief of, of social security payments and uh, a certain tax installments without interest. Uh, that have allowed uh, a certain management of the scarce cash that sometimes uh, startups have. And finally, um, the government approved some financial help for lease, for payment of the lease of, of the office or space that, that the small companies are using. So there's a kind of a social package that uh, small companies or emerging companies can benefit from. Uh, that, that is available and it's just a matter of getting uh, it, uh, organized. Uh, on the private sector, uh, it is true that the first weeks and months, all, all, uh, all of March and April and beginning of May, we saw a dramatic slowdown of uh, M&A transactions in, in, in general, in, in all over the world, I guess, and Spain was no exception. But deals are slow, slowly going back to life. To begin with, there are, there are investors whose work it is to actually make investments and, uh, and to follow, um, as Esther pointed out, there is a, an excess of liquidity that has to go somewhere. So um, we expect to see a rebound in the M&A activity concerning startups and technology sectors, which has proven so essential in this crisis. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Very, very comprehensive answer. Thank you, Teresa. Enrico, how, how, from the Italian perspective, has the, has the government stepped in to support the startup ecosystem? And what's kind of the private sector funding looking like at the moment? Okay. C can you hear me well? Yep. Okay, okay. So let me start saying that the, the good news is that the BC market in Italy is very small. And why, why is this a good news? Because startups are really used to working without funding. It's really hard to find money in Italy. So uh, you need to be really strong in order to raise significant capital here. 
And that's good news because when you enter into a crisis such as this one, when most VCs are scaling back and you know cutting investments and and so on, startups are kind of used to it. They are kind of ready to survive for a few more months, scaling down, cutting costs. They're very resilient. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sell this to you as, as good news, but I'm, I'm seriously thinking that the fact uh, Italian startups are really resilient and, and, and they tend to operate without much funding has helped them a lot. Yeah. Nevertheless, there's no cash in the system. It's, uh, it's re really hard for them to survive. Some of them have been pivoting very quickly. Uh, I have to say this has been a, an, a tremendous opportunity for some of them to, to prove that some business cases are better than others in, in testing and learning very, very quickly. Um, this is, like I said, uh, they twisted a bit focusing on a pragmatic approach um, and maybe focusing their little investment in the, in the strongest uh, startup of, of the bunch. Um, back, to, back to the basics, probably. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's more the time for pragmatic startups who are going to generate revenue in the short run rather than the big unicorn, but you need to believe in a dream, three years, no revenue, and these sort of things. So most startups are making that move today, trying to get revenue and get margins in the short run. Fortunately, the government did uh, pull up a few measures. Uh, so there's quite some money um, on the market now. They set up very quickly a 100 million fund uh, for startups, um, R&D tax reductions, re -de delays to pay tax um, in general, and tax cuts for private investors up to 50% is the same to EIS I think, in the UK. And this is now raised from 30 to 40 to 50% uh, tax breaks if you invest in a startup today. Moreover, uh, moreover, the government set up a 200 million fund to support VCs, which is a bit of chicken and egg, because then you need to rely on VCs to be open and flood the market with that money. Eventually, that will happen. It hasn't started yet. I would say that all the small deals have been delayed. The big deals that probably started where the conversation started three months ago, they are going ahead. So there has been a few announcements in the, in the last few weeks about big companies acquiring small startups for significant amount of money. But that is certainly something that started probably late, late next, next year. Thank you. And then for the, the last region, for Emiliano and for Andrew and Miriam, can you pick a market? I mean, you cover many markets or will be covering many markets. Is there, is there a market where you've seen either significant government support and or significant private sector uh, funding going into startups? Is it Poland? Is it Czech Republic? Is it someplace else? It'd be good to get your perspective on a market that you're particularly enthusiastic about as we come out of lockdown. Well, I think we, we need to look at emerging Europe as an emerging market. So, uh, you know, it, 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 when you have a crisis, and if we look back to 2008 and 2009, uh, countries in emerging Europe or emerging markets in general were the ones that actually suffered the most. Uh, um, and, and, you know, access to financing is actually quite difficult here. Uh, when it comes to um, any of our countries and government support there, Unfortunately, I haven't noticed any specific country that would direct, you know, support for or to startups. Uh, there were plenty of different uh, support programs, but they were addressed to pretty much all companies. So uh, some of these ideas have been mentioned, like you know, tax uh, taxes have been postponed and social contributions and so on and so on but not something specifically um, uh, addressed to startups. I think what is really interesting is, and this is what Enrico uh, said as well, uh, startups in, in Eastern Europe uh, have been used to actually less finance in general. So they have been more resilient and they are able to survive a little bit longer 
uh, than you know maybe in Western Europe. Uh, but at the same time, there. So you asked me about the market. I think you know the biggest markets uh, are the most interesting ones, and I would definitely mention Poland here. I would uh, I would mention the Czech Republic. I would mention Ukraine as well. That's a huge market. Uh, but there's there's also a few interesting things happening. So. For example, tomorrow I'm taking part in a, a PEVC conference that is focused on Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so, so again, you know, there is interest, there, there are things happening. And also, one more thing that is quite optimistic, I would say, it seems that, you know, there is, you know, talent in, in Eastern Europe has been well known for quite some time already. And, and it seems that uh, you know, people who were working on different projects, especially related to health, have now somehow emerged and, and said, oh, you know, listen, guys, we are actually working on that. We have a solution here. And very often, these solutions are actually more, uh, well, cheaper, basically. Uh, so they're not relying on, on, on super uh, expensive technologies. Um, yeah, so, so that would be pretty much an, an overview here. Okay, great. I'm going to ask one more question, but for, for those uh, who are not GTA leads on the call, if you have a question, I might have a minute or two to ask them. So put the question in the chat if you don't mind. Um, and so let's, let me just go on and just very quickly ask each of the leads. What is, what, is there one particular lesson that you or your market is learning about the pandemic that going forward, you're gonna say, we're gonna do something very different. Um, today, so let me start with you. Well, when this all started, it was a very, very difficult time, both for, for our clients, for our network members, and for us as entrepreneurs and business people, um, ourselves. So the two things we, we have learned and uh, after these months is, First one is hold on to your values, mission, and mi vision and mission. If yeah. you don't know what to do, just take, a take your time and read those again because they will inspire you. And second one is the key importance of liquidity. You need to have access to liquidity. You need to be prepared for bad times, downturns. Very good point. Thank you. Jeanette, I'm going to try you um, on the same question. I know your, your connection's not that stable, but is there a particular lesson learned that you picked up or you're seeing from the Nordic's perspective coming out of the pandemic? No, nothing. Okay, <laughs> let me come back. So, Enrico, let me move over to you. So, I think a couple of basic learning. Uh, one uh, for most businesses, I think, is down to the fact that you you can plan to a certain extent. The market changes can be totally unpredictable, and you know, from one day to another, you will find yourself in a totally different situation that nobody could have foreseen. That is a, a situation where either you move quick or, and, and transform yourself or you die. And that, that I think, is the is a, is a basic lesson everybody learned, those who died and those who survived. The second lesson I think I mentioned at the beginning is it can be done. In Italy, most families with children going to school and most businesses have been experiencing a digital disruption they couldn't foresee before, and they coped with it. The school system did work online from one day to the next, and smart working has been implemented by most companies in Italy. And this is something, if you asked me this question six months ago, I would have said, no, it will never work. Thank you, good point. Esther. What do you see? What, what lesson learned are you picking up from the Netherlands? Uh, I think uh, an opportunity for greater collaboration to strengthen the sector. Um, certainly people, you know, big companies talking, I think a lot more greater communication because of the challenges that they're facing, which are shared um, and very solutions focused. 
um, in terms of how to how to kind of move through and out of this um, this crisis and learn from it. Great, thank you, Andrew. Andrew, you're on mute. Yeah, uh, I just realized that when I started saying uh, the first word. So uh, I think uh, I think it's uh, the 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 most important lesson would be to just get together uh, and, and, and start talking about it, uh, about the problem basically, and, and sharing different experiences and learning from each other. Uh, because you know, it, it's not that we have all the answers right away, but maybe by sharing, by kind of being uh, with it or in it together, uh, you know, we, can, we can actually survive. That's and networking and here, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And I would here also add openness to change. Because I think that is something here um, that a lot of people um, had to do. And uh, let's say openness to change to technology, but also to new business models. And with that, of course, comes agility, which has been said by Enrico already, in a way. Um, and diversif diversification, of course, of your offering. That's great. Thank you, Miriam. Jeanette, I'm going to try you one more time, if you can hear us. I know you're now on your iPhone. Do you want to just share a quick lesson from the pandemic? <laughs> maybe yes, maybe no. Okay, let me move on. Um, I have a question from Mark Duke. Mark actually runs the Tech London Advocates Creative Tech Working Group, which covers ad tech, martech, brand tech, fashion tech, design tech, music tech, et cetera. And he would like to know if any of you have coming across any interesting or significant creative tech companies in your respective ecosystems. Anybody want to address that or answer that or say if you've come across something, someone? Esther, anyone in the Netherlands that comes to mind? I don't know. I don't know if it, I don't know if it counts, but I was just thinking of Heart with their Hyperloop. Have you seen this? Okay. I don't know if that counts as creative tech. I think it's creative. Like, well, I'm just very excited about it because it's like living in a science fiction uh, novel, <laughs> but in real time. So, um, yeah, the, I would say from that, yeah, they're looking at, um, well, actually, it's related to the pandemic, you know, flights and, you know, and all of that is kind of actually going, if they can get this Hyperloop working through, um, yeah, through Europe, it could be really exciting. So, I, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. Sorry. <laughs> You're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, well, in Spain, um, I couldn't single out uh, um, a startup in particular, but I do have seen people cooperate or, or on a non-profit basis to face this pandemic, which has been understood as a threat to, to, to Spanish economy and Spanish uh, way of living. And in that respect, I would highlight COVID fighters which is an, um, an well, uh, probably nothing, probably not even an association, but a group of professionals providing free uh, advice to, um, to, to companies that need it. And uh, also Alastria, the uh, consortium of blockchain, which is formed by leading Spanish firms, uh, universities and law firms. Uh, uh, has, uh, we are working together to provide a protocol of the traceability of the people who have suffered the disease and to follow up uh, with a joint protocol, uh, how to identify the KPIs uh, connected to the disease. Uh, so I, rather than uh, individual uh, businesses, I would talk about uh, joint efforts from the community. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, there's no, no other responses from anybody else. I know we're coming up to the hour. I'm conscious of time. So I wanted to, to thank everyone for joining us today. For all of the GTA leaders, um, we will be setting up um, a global GTA call in the not too distant future. Um, HP has renewed their sponsorship of Global Tech Advocates. So I will be writing to you more specifically about the collaboration that's going to happen there and the type of help and support we'd love to have you uh, participate in. We're going to be adding more content to the GTA website, which is at globaltechadvocates.org. Um, so again, thank you everyone for taking the time today. We're going to put this recording on the YouTube channel um, where it's available for everyone and the team at Seven Hills will be actively promoting this uh, through both the Tech London Advocates and Global Tech Advocates 
uh, Twitter handles. I'll put this in LinkedIn. So it'd be great if you could do the same on, on your social channels. Um, just as a reminder, uh, the TLA COVID-19 Resource Hub is up and available. Uh, Jeanette's got the Technordic Advocates COVID-19 Resource Hub up and available. I know both of these hubs have been used extensively. We've seen a five-fold increase in web traffic to the TLA site since we launched on the 27th of March. So there's a lot of interest in, in what's happening and what we're doing out there. Um, so do use that as a resource. Um, we have the surgeries on there, but we have the directory of advocates all available for people to use. And if anybody's got a follow-up question afterwards, please feel free to get in touch. With that, thank you to all of the leads uh, from Tech Nordic Advocates, Tech Italy Advocates, Tech Spain Advocates, Tech Netherlands Advocates, and Tech Emerging Europe Advocates for being part of this session. Um, stay safe, be well, and we look forward to being in touch soon.